Good morning. It's May 24th, and I'm Kenny Polcari, and this is host of the party, Morning Market Commentary. And as you can see, I'm back under the Tiki Hut, right here on the beach in South Palm Beach. The sun is coming up, the tide is high, the sky is blue. It's going to be another spectacular day here in South Florida. So let's talk about it. What's hap what happened and what's happening to get the weeks off uh, as, the, as the week begins. U.S. markets ended mixed last week, although futures are higher this morning. Services, PMI, blowing the roof off the house at 70.1%. Uh, as the country reopens, right? Crypto assets continuing to get slammed around back and forth. Uh, they happy you saw, remember what happened last week on Wednesday, we had the complete breakdown. They rallied into Thursday and Friday. They broke down again on Friday afternoon. They broke down again over the weekend on Sunday. And this morning, once again, they're rallying as the nervousness and angst around cryptocurrencies uh, continues. Uh, oil, which also had come under pressure last week, falling, you know, much more than I thought it should have fallen, four or five points on, on the talk of the U.S.-Iranian nuclear deal possibly coming back and then Iran bringing uh, oil supply to the market sent oil a little bit lower. I think it was way overdone. The pendulum swings too far to the left. And in fact, on Friday, traders found an opportunity in oil and they took it up 3% to end the day at 63.86. And this morning, it's up another 2% trading at 64 and change. As Goldman Sachs comes out and reiterates uh, their bullish argument on oil and $70 WTI, West Texas Intermediate, uh, by the summer. And what's for dinner tonight? We're going to try the veal scallopini with a white wine cream sauce sauce with porcini mushrooms. It is absolutely delicious, but we'll get to that in a minute. So what happened on Friday, right? Stocks finished the day mixed, um, giving back, you know, they started out strong, but then as the clock ticked down to four, uh, a lot of them gave back many of the gains. While the Dow ended up 123 points, the S&P lost uh, four points. The NASDAQ was down 65 points, yet the Russell added 75. For the week, though, the Dow, the S&P, and the Russell all ended in the negative territory, while NASDAQ uh, ended in positive territory. And that does make some sense sense, right? Because they've really beaten up NASDAQ over the last couple of weeks. So when there's an opportunity and when there are traders looking for um, some opportunities, they're going to go in and buy the stocks that have been unnecessarily uh, mispriced or beaten up. Value continues to outperform growth. And I think, you know how I feel, I think that is going to be the story uh, this year and it continues to play out. Uh, we had financials, we had energies, we had industrials, we had materials all outperforming last week and leading the way while we had tech, uh, communication services, we had consumer discretionary uh, all leading the way lower last week. We had some great reports out of retailers. They're really blowing uh, the, the windows out of the house um, on very strong numbers, the numbers that were expected, right? Easily beating the expectations that had been laid, laid out for us. Yet, some are beginning to talk about some margin pressures and those margin pressures are gonna be passed on through high prices to the consumer so just be aware treasuries ended the week mixed right they ended at 1.62 now treasuries have been stuck in this 1.6 to 1.65 yielding range uh, for a while now it almost feels like for a month a month and a half and they ended right there 1.62 uh, the dollar index which came under lots of pressure uh, last week broke down through 90 trading at 89 and change uh, ended the ended the week there and in fact is, is pressured a little bit lower this morning gold which has rallied over the last couple of weeks uh, settled unchanged at 1878, while Bitcoin and the other uh, cryptocurrencies were all over the place, starting on Wednesday when they broke down till, till uh, Thursday and Friday's rally, and then again on Friday's uh, pressure. By 4 o'clock on Friday afternoon, Bitcoin had lost 12% uh, and ended the day down at about 35,000. Ethereum lost 18%, ending the day at 2,200. Um, more news of the China crackdown, more news of uh, 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 potential new regulation coming out of the U.S. Treasury and tax compliance kind of sending shivers down the spines of traders and investors. And over the weekend, that sent those cryptos down even more. At one point, Bitcoin trading down below 32,000 and Ethereum breaking 1,900 before they rally back. And again, this morning, they are once again trading up, um, but there continues to be that nervousness um in in uh in the uh, cryptos okay now on the econ on the economic front last week we had really friday we had really really strong reports on purchasing managers indexes right you had the manufacturing pmi uh that was already going to be strong at 60.2 that's already a strong number but that number came in at 61.5 an even stronger number but the one to really keep your eyes on and think about is the u.s services pmi and why is that because the u.s economy is a 75 percent service economy so anything to do with services is really 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 bullish when it talks about kind of a recovering u.s economy and while the expectation for the service Services PMI was 64.3, which which by itself would have been a very strong number. 
when it was reported, it came in at 70.1, an even stronger number than the expectations. And now with a seven handle on it, suggesting that as the, as the, the world and the U.S. economy reopens, right, uh, hotel industry, travel, leisure industry, restaurants are all coming back. These are all service industries uh, and they are coming back strong. And that and that is uh, bullish, right? That's bullish for the country. It's bullish certainly for the markets and it's bullish for people looking for jobs. Existing home sales though for April was very interesting. Shows continues to show a cooling off, which makes some sense, right? Existing home sales fell by 2.7% month over month as skyrocketing prices uh, and, uh, and supply shortages remain obstacles for people looking to buy homes. And people are starting to really think about stepping back as you watch, especially um, uh, new home sales are going up at the rate of ridiculous. It's almost going up 10% a month because uh, these new home, the, the, the uh, home builders keep telling you that the price of raw materials, the, the lumber and everything that goes into building a house goes up uh, out of control. And so therefore people are starting to step back. And when you have an existing house, a lot of people want to go in there and remodel it. And then they think about having to go to Home Depot and buying lumber and all that stuff to remodel. And once again, it's causing people just to step back a little bit and say, you know what, this might be getting a little bit too hot for me. So let's just, let's just step back from it and see what happens. We're going to get more data this week on on, uh, on pending home sales and new home sales, right? And so what's new in D.C.? Well, uh, it seems to me that Joey is set to reduce his infrastructure proposal from $2.5 trillion to $1.7 trillion, uh, kind of in a nod as negotiations with GOP legislators. But the GOP right away still said no to that, uh, and, and noting the differences in the definition, the very definition of the word infrastructure, as well as really how they're going to pay for this. And those both remain very key issues. So while there is conversation, there's really no definitive issue. But the one that's really important um, are comments that came out of two Fed presidents, right? We had Dallas's uh, Fed president, uh, Patty Harker, and uh, excuse me, we had um, Philly's president, Patty Harker, and Dallas's president, Bobby Kaplan, both come out. Both of them come out saying that it's about time we start talking about tapering. Now, that's very interesting because, you know, this whole conversation about when to taper, are we going to taper, are they thinking about tapering, has been very, very coy, right? We're going back and forth. We hear that Jay Powell says, absolutely not, we're not anywhere there yet, and we're going to give the, we're going to give the markets and investors plenty of runway, plenty of time. We're going to hint about hinting, about thinking, about talking, about uh, tapering. Uh, and that's all well and good. Yet these two Fed presidents came right out and said, listen, it's time to start talking. They flew right to the talking part of it. Forget the hinting about hinting about thinking about it. They went right to talking. So that's going to be very interesting uh, to see how to see how other Fed members or even Jay Powell reacts to that comment. Right. Recall that after the FOMC minutes came out last week, there was some talk about kind of a fissure in the in the thinking of the brain trust. Some people really wanted to talk about tapering while others did not, suggesting that that was, in fact, the first warning sign. That was the first hint that there was stuff going on in the brain trust, whether or not they want to they want to officially announce it or not. But my sense is we're getting close to that tapering conversation than not. Um, over the weekend, as I said, we watched more volatility in the crypto space. We saw Bitcoin trade down and through 32,000 and Ethereum traded uh, down through 1,900 while do doggy coin traded below 25 cents. But as of five o'clock this morning, they've all seemed to stabilize and are trading higher. Bitcoin is now trading back at 36,000. Ethereum's back above 2,300 and doggy coins traded at about 23 cents. And you, like I said, US futures are up this morning despite all this crypto meltdown and crypto crypto nervousness, right? Dow futures are up 125 points. The S&Ps are up 17. NASDAQ up uh, 63 points and the Russell's adding 10. Rumors that the continued nervousness and weakness in the cryptos might suggest there are going to be margin calls on investors that have borrowed money to buy crypto, suggesting that then that pressure is going to come to the U.S. market and uh, uh, investors and traders are going to sell stocks in order to raise cash to pay margin calls that they bought the crypto with. That hasn't happened yet. Uh, but hold on to that thought because clearly the day is young uh, and the week is young. Uh, hints that the Fed is expecting another weak jobs report uh, next week when we get the NFP report for May. Um, suggest that uh, uh, to investors that okay we're getting another weak jobs report which is gonna which is gonna bolster the Fed's argument that we're not there yet so the Fed's not going anywhere is really kind of causing that excitement in futures today with investors thinking okay it's risk on because once again this report is going to be weak they think it's going to be weak and so therefore their argument is going to be they're not going anywhere yet. 
Uh, we're starting to see pressure on some of the other central banks, though it's very interesting. Remember, Bank of Canada a couple of weeks ago suggested that they're going to start to change their uh, their asset buying program taper, which means uh, AKA taper. And now we saw that uh, uh, from the Bank of England, right? Where they propose uh, they're going to slow their asset purchases uh, from 4.4 billion pounds a week to 3.2 billion pounds a, pounds a week, all while making sure to tell investors, well, they're really not tapering. Well, last time I checked, when you start when you start buying 1.2 billion pounds less per week, seems to me that's a little bit tapering. But they're qualifying and defining it. Well, it's not really tapering because we never really changed our end goal. So if our end goal was to buy X, we may potentially still buy X if we need to. Meanwhile, they're going to start to pull back on the weekly purchases, which is interesting because I think it's just the way to kind of get it started. So don't be surprised if we start to see that kind of conversation uh, perk up around here. Eco data this week includes a housing price index, which leads me to ask, do we really need an index to tell anyone what's happening to housing prices? If you live in the world, you know what's happening to housing prices. New home sales, they are expected to be down 7% month over month. And I just told you why, right? People are starting to pull back. They're not so sure they want to pay these increasing prices because they appear to be out of control. Some places not even able to secure a price uh, until they get further down the line in terms of building the house. And so uh, consumers appear to be stepping back. Uh, you're also going to get the Richmond Fed survey. We're going to get mortgage apps. We're going to get durable goods. Expectation of uh, eight tenths of a percent. We're going to get the first revision to the first quarter GDP, although not really expected to change much. I think it was 6.5 last month. It's going to be probably 6.4 this month is what the expectation is. We're going to get pending home sales, so homes that have already gone into contract, that's uh, expected to be up by a half a percent. We're going to get the Kansas City Fed, wholesale and retail inventories, personal income and personal spending, along with the other usual suspects, initial jobs, claims, and continuing lending. European markets are, are that are open are high this way. Now, there's a, a holiday going on there in Europe, so not all of them are open. Uh, there's no really uh, any macro data or any, any other conversations taking place that's going to really drive the direction, so most of it is just kind of a risk on uh, after to the weakness that we saw over the last couple weeks. As I said, oil continues to ride. Investors are now taking it up another 1.8% this morning. It's trading at 64, almost $65, uh, as our friends at Goldman Sachs come out and reiterate that story. Uh, and the case about uh, higher prices remaining intact despite uh, the threat of increasing supplies out of Iran. Remember what I said, the increasing supplies out of Iran are gonna be a million barrels. It's not like they're gonna add five or six million barrels to supply. They're adding a million barrels. And so therefore, it's nothing really to get nervous is about considering the world is about to reopen and if you've been here in the united states and you've done anything but travel you'll see that people are not going to be held down and so the argument for higher prices and more activity and more demand for energy is alive and well right uh uh, Goldman still expects WTI to be $70 a barrel by the summer. I would agree with that. My sense is that uh, as we continue to open up, you're going to see demand surge. The S&P closed at 41.55 on Friday, and it tested the key trend line support, 4087, which is its 50-day moving average. It tested it three times last week, and that typically suggests you test it once, you test it twice, you test it three times, and if it holds a third time, then it suggests that there's enough demand there. Thus, we see this bounce. And again, we saw the bounce a little bit of bounce on Friday. Again, we're going to see the uh, bounce today. Um, as the, as the kind of nervousness over the last couple of weeks dissipates, the whole conversation about the Fed, even the cryptos aren't really bothering it so much this morning, which then tells you that, you know, the market's trying is starting to separate what's really happening in the crypto space versus what's happening in the opportunity space with stocks. I'm still in the camp that the volatility is not over, um, which doesn't mean that we're going to get a collapse, but don't expect there's going to be smooth sailing from here. My sense is that the volatility, will, the vol volatility is going to continue uh, at least for the next couple of months as we get more macro data and and we enter the summer we see what happens with oil demand we see what happens with the country we see what happens with you know demand across a range of industries so uh keep keep yourself strapped in um and if you're going to play in the crypto world, if you're going to play in the crypto world, I'm not suggesting you don't, because I do think people do need exposure, because I think it is going to change the world in the years to come. You should probably look to keep that anywhere between a two to four or a three to five percent allocation in your portfolio, not more than that, because you don't want to necessarily get wiped out if something stupid happens in the crypto market. So keep it at a level where you're comfortable, but I wouldn't put it any more, any max at five percent, but I'd probably keep it somewhere between two and four percent. 
You know that you can text the word invest to 21,000, get my digital business card. Feel free to text it, download the card right to your phone. Feel free to reach out, send me an email, send me a text message, give me a call. I'm always happy to talk about the markets. I'm always happy to talk about uh, a planning and a structure. Um, you can also follow me on Twitter at Kenny Polkari. So what are we having for dinner tonight? Oh my God, this is so delicious. It's veal scallopini and a white wine cream sauce with porcini mushrooms. Uh, and uh, you could put a mixture of mushrooms, but we use porcini mushrooms and white mushrooms in this uh, in this dish tonight. So what do you need for this? You need uh, you need about three quarters of an ounce of dried porcini mushrooms, and you can find those at a, at an Italian uh, a grocery store or a high end uh, a high end grocery store, right? You need a pound of fresh mushrooms, just sliced fresh mushrooms or whole mushrooms. You slice them yourself. You need a stick of butter. You need dried sage leaves, which you're going to chop finely. You need six veal scallopinis, which you can get uh, at the butcher. You need white wine. Again, you know what I use, Pinot Grigio Santa Margarita. I would not use a Chardonnay for this, but I wouldn't use Chardonnay for anything. So uh, uh, that kind of that kind of sets that straight. You need chopped Italian parsley, salt and pepper, and you need heavy cream. You're going to need about a half a cup of heavy cream uh, to make this dish really work. So first start by taking the dried porcini mushrooms and soak them in a cup of warm water for about a half an hour, right? Let them soak. They'll come back to life. The water takes on the, the taste of the mushrooms and that's very important because you're going to use that water afterwards as part of the recipe. Once they're soaked, take a slotted spoon and take the mushrooms out. Uh, and now in a strainer, cause there'll be, there'll be grit and stuff that's in the water. So through a fine mesh strainer, strain the water into a cup and then hold that separate or into another bowl, hold that separate set it aside because like i said you're going to use it um, take the fresh mushrooms uh not the butchies but the fresh mushrooms that you bought if you didn't buy sliced ones just take them and just slice them out set them aside now in a big saute pan you're going to add uh, about a half a stick of butter uh, and you're going to add the chopped sage that you've uh, the sage that you've chopped you're going to add that to the butter you're going to set, saute it around uh, put the heat like on medium high. Uh, you want to you want to put a, a splash of olive oil in there just so the butter doesn't burn. Um, next, you're going to add once it's nice and hot. Uh, again, you don't want the butter to burn. You can tell when it's getting hot. You're going to take the veal scallopinis um, and you're going to add them. You're just going to pat them dry. You're going to season them with salt and pepper. Then you're going to add them to the sauté pan. Uh, don't crowd them. You should probably cook for maybe three to five minutes total, right? One side, flip on the other side, maybe three to five minutes total. Veal scallopinis are not thick, so they'll cook relatively quickly. So don't overcook them um, uh, because you still want them. Uh, if you overcook them, then they'll get tough, right? Uh, so now what you're going to do is is you're going to add the white wine. So you're going to add about three quarters of a cup of the white wine directly to the pan. You're going to let it br bring it to a boil uh, and then turn the heat down. Uh, remove the veal. Now place the veal on the plate uh, and continue to steam the wine, right? So pour the wine in while the veal is still in there. Bring it to a boil. Turn the heat down. Now take the veal scallopinis out and just set them on a plate uh, side. While you leave, the wine will continue. The alcohol will burn off and it'll continue to steam away. Scraping the bottom of the pan, right, as you're trying to get anything that's on the bottom of the pan off uh, before the wine is evaporated. Now, add back as the, as the wine completely now evaporates. Now, add back that mushroom water right put it right in the saute pan and the porcinis that you brought back to life put those right in the pan with the mushroom water stirring and allow uh some of that liquid to also evaporate now take the sliced fresh mushrooms add those to the pan um along with the chopped parsley season it with salt and pepper turn them around saute them you want to you want to get the the mushrooms to start to cook you don't want them you know mushrooms like when they cook right you want to turn the heat to low, cover the pan, but every once in a while, just go in there and stir the pan, right? The, 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 the fresh mushrooms will make their own water, so they will make their own juice, so it's not going to dry out. You don't have to worry about that. And if you keep the top on it, the condensation will also uh, keep them moist and keep, uh, and keep some juice in the pan. Um, now, now after, I don't know, 10 minutes, after you've seen that the mushrooms are cooked, you know, it could be 15 minutes, you do it on low. You just want the mushrooms to be cooked. You know when they're cooked. Take the uh, take the uh, uh, top off. You're going to add probably another splash of wine. Might be a quarter of a cup, a splash of wine. Add it right to the mushrooms again. And now you're going to add 
uh, half a cup of the heavy cream. This is where it gets really good, right? So you put the heavy cream right, add the wine, bring it up to a boil again, turn the heat up high, then uh, uh, bring it to a boil, then turn the heat down to simmer, add the heavy cream, mix it all together. Don't put the heavy cream in there when the heat's on really high because you run the risk of, of curdling it. So, you know, bring the heat up for the wine, bring it down once it starts to boil uh, to simmer, and then add the heavy cream, stir it all around, um, until it mixes, right? It'll start to thicken up. Now take your veal scallopini pieces, put them back in the saute pan with all the, the mushrooms and the wine and the cream. Uh, season, taste it. Uh, and if it needs an adjustment in seasoning, you can adjust it now with salt and pepper there. It's very simple to do. Um, and leave it long, leave it just, leave the scallopinis back in this wine and cream just long enough that, you know, it kind of comes together and it heats back up. It might be two or three minutes. That's it. You're not gonna leave them in there very long. Um, and then, and then you can, you know, while they're in there, you can turn the scallopinis over to get both sides back, make sure that they're all uh, uh, blended with the sauce. At that point, you're gonna, you're gonna present these on a warm plate. Uh, you're gonna maybe make them with steamed asparagus. It's always a great dish, something green on the plate uh, to brighten it up, along with um, um, uh, a, a big a mixed salad, right? You're gonna make a mixed salad of arugula, Boston bib. You're gonna put maybe even some fresh spinach in there, chop up some red onions, cucumbers, sliced cherry tomatoes, or sliced, uh, sliced garden tomatoes if you have them. Season it with salt, pepper, oregano, um, uh, a squirt of fresh lemon juice, and some olive oil. That's perfect, that's really all you need. Uh, you can enjoy this with you know your favorite red wine. I would drink a nice Merlot with this, uh, something that's not really too heavy, but that's medium body. One way or the other, you can see it's an absolutely gorgeous day. I'm gonna get ready to do more work. I wish I could go to the beach, but I was at the beach yesterday and it was absolutely spectacular. In any event, have a great day. I will see you tomorrow morning.